Madam President, the um, minority leader just uh, got up and attacked the Senate for not doing anything and then proceeded to announce that we're going to be voting today on the Director of National Intelligence. Seems like a pretty important position. The person that's in charge of all the intelligence activities uh, that we conduct around the world to make sure that we keep our country safe. So if the Senate is here and not doing anything, it seems like a, a real contradiction to suggest that we're actually going to vote today on a consequential position or position that's important to America's national security interest. Just one of many uh, that we're going to be voting on and have been voting on, Madam President, over the past several weeks. The other thing that the, uh, the leader, the Democrat leader, forgot to uh, acknowledge is that uh, last week we passed reforms to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, a piece of legislation that's also important to national security that authorizes and funds all our intelligence activities and also included reforms, reforms that many in this body on both sides of the aisle wanted to see adopted. That was an important piece of legislation and one that I think has uh, tremendous consequences. I would add grave consequences for the United States of America and our national security interests. The Senate's also been very involved, um, I suspect maybe to the Democrat leader's chagrin, in e examining and looking at all the coronavirus legislation that we've already passed and the impact that it's having and whether or not it is being effective and where we need to do more and where we need to fix things or refine or tweak things in a way to make those programs that we funded and authorized uh, work better. But Madam President, to suggest that the Senate hasn't done anything on the coronavirus, really? Really? My gosh, we passed four bills Four bills, Madam President, totaling, totaling almost $3 trillion through the United States Senate, through the House of Representatives, on the President's desk, and signed into law. $3 trillion, Madam President, four pieces of legislation. And it was done in a bipartisan way. Democrats and Republicans cooperated because it's important to our country to make sure that we are responding to an enormous crisis, an extraordinary crisis that required an extraordinary response. And the response, I would argue, Madam President, has been extraordinary. Never in my lifetime, or certainly my time in the Senate, or for that matter, I would argue anybody else's time in the Senate, has the United States Senate done anything of that scale, scope, or consequence. And many of those programs that we authorized and funded, those four pieces of legislation, which passed as recently as a couple of months ago, are the dollars are still getting out there. They're in the pipeline. They're going out to state and local governments. They're going out to health care providers, hospitals, nursing homes. They're going out to small businesses. They're going out to workers, employees, people who've been unemployed uh, through the unemployment insurance program. There's a lot of, lot of dollars in the pipeline, a lot of resources that have been expended, uh, Madam President, by the United States Senate the United States House and signed in law by the President. And so it seems logical, I would think, for us as stewards of the tax dollars, as representatives of the people of this country, as policymakers, to make sure that the policies that we're putting into place are having the desired effect and are actually working. So what has the Senate been doing for the past three weeks? Well, exactly that. Taking a look on a committee by committee basis at whether or not some of the things that we've already done are being effective. The Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee had in the head of the CDC, the head of the NIH, two critical agencies when it comes to fighting the health emergency of this country, to determine and to ask them questions about what's working, what's not working, what have we done, what should we be doing differently, what can we do, that was a hearing that the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee had last week, widely participated in by members on both sides of the aisle. I sit on the Senate Commerce Committee. We've had several hearings. We had a markup yesterday. We marked up 14 bills yesterday. But we also uh, have been looking at the impact of coronavirus legislation on 
those constituencies that are under the jurisdiction of the Senate Commerce Committee, one of which is the airline industry. And so we had a, a, a hearing examining the impact of the coronavirus on the aviation, on the airline industry in this country, and on the things that we have done to help and assist and support the airline industry in this country. So that was another thing, Madam President, that, uh, that the Commerce Committee did. And then more recently than that, we had a, a hearing on broadband connectivity and the, the, the way in which people through the coronavirus are staying able to stay connected, the way business is conducted, actually, frankly, for that matter, the way government is conducted, because obviously we're doing a lot of things through connectivity as well. And so we looked at, you know, what's working, what's not working. Are there areas in terms of making sure that parts of the country that don't have high-speed Internet services, that don't have broadband services, uh, could be better connected? And is that something that ought to be a part of any future legislation that we look at? Uh, the Banking Committee, Madam President, this week, the Banking Committee had the Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board and had the Secretary of the Treasury in front of that committee to ask them questions about what's happening in the financial services industry and what is the effect of all the money that we've spent, that we put out the door, uh, how is that working out there, and again, what can we be doing differently, uh, how can we improve, how can we do this better as we look to the future. Uh, those are just three committees that I can off the top of my head, not to mention the fact that the banking committee is also reporting out the uh, nominee to be the inspector general for the pandemic a very important position, I might add. Uh, and, and so they've been, they've been very active, very busy doing oversight work with respect to this pandemic. And so, Madam President, th that, 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 is just, that is just not true, what the Democrat leader just said. It's not true, it's not accurate. And frankly, I would think in the eyes of the American people, it's illogical to say that we have spent $3 trillion and we wouldn't want to take a look to see how that three trillion dollars is being spent, and whether it's being effective and whether it's being efficient, uh, and then look at where do we need to do more before we rush headlong in there and just push another three trillion dollars out the door. I, I think that's a rational way of looking at things that I think most of the American people would accept and and believe that these are this is what we elected you to do. We want to make sure that you're taking our tax dollars and spending them as wisely and well as possible in an efficient and effective way. And by the way. Just as a reminder to my colleagues, every dollar, every dollar, Madam President, that we spend is borrowed from our children and grandchildren. This doesn't just magically appear. We just don't, out of thin air, we're borrowing money. Now, granted, money that we needed to borrow, particularly the, what we've already done. Everybody acknowledges we had a crisis. We had to put out the fire, and, and we've, been, we've been doing that. But every dollar, prospectively, every dollar that we've already spent is a borrowed dollar, borrowed from future generations of Americans, and someday, dollars that we're going to have to repay. So wouldn't it be prudent, wouldn't it be logical, wouldn't it be rational for this body, the custodians, the stewards of the American people's tax dollars, to take a hard look at what's working and what's not working before rushing headlong into spending another $3 trillion? which the Democrat leader got up here and lauded and applauded the House of Representatives for blowing into town for 24 hours last Friday, cobbling together a, an ideological wish list. Now, granted, there's some things in there that are probably good ideas and maybe things that in the end could end up in a, in a piece of legislation. But it didn't get a single Republican vote and it didn't have a single consultation with Republicans in the House of Representatives about how to put it together. You know what, in the end, they couldn't keep all the Democrats. There were 14 Democrats that voted against that in the House of Representatives, and not a single Republican, which makes sense if you're a Republican. You never get asked. You're never at the table. You have no input whatsoever. They come in and put this thing together, 1,800 pages, $3 trillion, and what's it got in it? Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff, like studies. Studies as to whether or not there is diversity and inclusion in the marketing of marijuana. 68 references 
in the House bill to cannabis. 68 references. Only 52 references to jobs, which is what I would think the American people are a lot more concerned about. The House of Representatives evidently waited and in the balance thought, well, my gosh, studies on the diversity and inclusiveness of the marketing of cannabis was more important and weighed more heavily on the scale than the jobs that have been lost for the American people. That's what it looks like. I mean, they threw everything in there. They threw a tax cut, a tax cut for millionaires and billionaires. These guys get up here every single day and talk about Republicans, you know, helping out millionaires and billionaires. And what do the House bill have in it? A tax cut for millionaires and billionaires. 56% of that tax cut proceeds will go to those 1% top wage earners in America. Just think about that. Does that make sense? Does that make sense when you're fighting a pandemic? Probably not. They actually had tax increases on small businesses. No big surprise there. Tax increases are always something that they're quick to do. But Madam President, I just have to take issue with what the Democrat leader was down here saying and his characterization of what's going on here. This place, when you're responding to a crisis, needs to act in a bipartisan and a constructive way. Not in a partisan, ideological way. And I would also think in a thoughtful way. Giving a lot of consideration to what are we doing here with those borrowed dollars, borrowed from our kids and grandkids, and are we making the best use of them? That to me seems like maybe the great divide here and the great debate that we have, not only in this, but a lot of other issues. It just seems like the natural instinctive solution for my friends on the other side of the aisle is we can just solve this by throwing a lot of money out there. Well, I have to tell you, I don't think that's the way the American people view it. As they sit down and are making hard decisions right now about how to take care of their families, how to get through this economic crisis, I would think the decisions that they're making are along the same lines of the decisions that we ought to be making. And that is, how are we going to spend our dollars wisely and well? How are we going to be efficient and effective? This isn't our money. This is the American people's money. This is a crisis. It needs a response. We have responded in a massive way relative to anything that's happened probably in history, for sure in history. Two trillion, three trillion dollars? I mean, I can't think of a single time. Um, when we pass annual appropriation bills, they, they never get up to that level. We're talking about dollars on a scale like nothing we've ever seen before because that's what was required. And this institution demonstrated that notwithstanding our differences, we could work together in a constructive way, in a bipartisan way, to do what was necessary to deliver for the American people. And we will do what's necessary to get the American people through this crisis. But please, please, can we do that in a thoughtful way, in a constructive way, in a bipartisan way, in a way that says, wow, let's actually sit down and think about what makes the most sense here. Let's see what's out there and what's actually worked. The Paycheck Protection Program arguably has worked really well. We put now $660 billion into that particular program. And I think it's gotten pretty big dividend, pretty big result. A lot of businesses are still functioning, still operating. A lot of workers are still working. That was what that was all about. It was to keep those jobs, to keep those workers working. Now, there have been some hiccups and there have been some things that need to be fixed. And we ought to look at what we can do to refine it, make it work better, make it work more efficiently. Same thing's true with a lot of the dollars that go out to state and local governments. And we have $150 billion in the pipeline that have gone out to state and local governments many of which, I might add, um, are probably going to need help, particularly with revenue replacement. But there are, there's a lot of dollars in the pipeline out already, in addition to the $150 billion that we've done for state and local governments, that went out in previous 
versions, previous legislation of the four bills that we passed, the total sum now of dollars that have gone to state governments is about 500 billion or half a trillion dollars. So it's not just the 150 billion that we put out, but a lot of that's still in the pipeline. And a lot of it, before we put more out there, before we say, oh, let's put another trillion out there, which is what the House was proposing, maybe we ought to look at what the need is. Maybe we ought to find out what the revenue loss actually is, because those numbers are just coming in. This thing really hit us hard a couple of months ago, so the real, the real, the, the real impact of this is going to be felt April, May, into the summer. But as things start to open up again, hopefully we gradually climb out of this and those numbers start to improve. Those horrible unemployment numbers, those horrible uh, revenue numbers at the state level, those start to come back. We start to see the economy get going back in a more normal direction. But before we rush, before we rush out there with another several trillion, and who knows, Madam President, who really knows at what point you hit the wall when it comes to borrowing? I mean, we think that the Federal Reserve thinks it's got lots of levers and they can leverage their balance sheet and they can still do things and they think that, you know, fiscally we've got some headroom that we can maneuver within. But if you think about this, before this all started, our debt to GDP ratio was 79 percent. 79 percent. You know what, for 2020, our debt to GDP ratio is going to be, and that doesn't include anything that we do from here on. It just captures what's already been done. Our debt to GDP ratio will be 101. One to one. And that was always the level when we saw the Greeces of the world and all these countries that were just completely, you know, in this downward spiral, this quagmire of debt. That was always the metric. One to one, 100 percent debt to GDP. That's the, that's the break point. That's when you start entering in that really dangerous territory. Well, imagine if we add another three trillion on top of that. The three trillion that we've already done, taking the debt to GDP from 79 percent to 101 percent, is the biggest increase, the biggest increase in debt to GDP that we've seen since 1943, when we were powering up for World War II. Now granted, this is like a war. This is a fight that we have to win, and we need to do whatever it takes to win it. But let's do it in a smart way, in a thoughtful way, in a way that gives consideration to the future generations whose liability everything that we spend today will become because everything that we do is borrowed money. And we've got to remember that, Madam President. So, Madam President, I came down here to talk about the Internet, and, and uh, I guess it's a speech I can save for another day. I was going to talk about China and the things that we need to be doing with China when it comes to protecting uh, our cybersecurity. And, um, but I see my colleague from Illinois here is waiting to speak. But I just thought it was important that we take a moment and pause and think about where we are and what we've done. And as we think about what we're going to do next, make sure we're doing it in a thoughtful, smart, conscientious, right way, an efficient and effective way on behalf of the American people and the American taxpayer. So, Madam President, I yield the floor.